When pandemics hit in the past, we put sick individuals in the quarantine. But when the current pandemic hit, we shut down the entire society, including the entire economy. I suspect that the shutdown was a mistake, uh, especially uh, the prolonged shutdown was a mistake due to its uh, astronomical, economic, psychological and uh, non-COVID related deaths. But I could be wrong. And to set me straight, I am happy to welcome to the COVID tonic Michael McCulloch, a professor of uh, psychology at the University of California in San Diego and the author of a new book, The Kindness of Strangers, How a Selfish Ape Invented a New Moral Code. So, Michael, welcome. Thanks for having me, Marian. My absolute pleasure. Um, we will turn to your book in a moment, but let's start uh, with a theory that I heard about the shutdown. And it goes something like this. Uh, humans, especially people who've been living in Western societies, have been moving away from death. Whereas our ancestors were surrounded by death all the time. People were dying left and right, there was violence, there was malnutrition, there was disease. Um, we don't really encounter death until our parents or our grandparents die. So everything in our society is intended to postpone individual death and the shutdown is the attempt to postpone uh, death at, on a very large scale. That's at any rate a theory that I recently heard. Do you buy it? I, I do buy it actually. I, I think one of the things that you know has interested me uh, as I've sort of tried to understand a little bit of the evolution of our concern for strangers over the past you know, few millennia is uh, I'm sort of borrowing from a, a uh, an insight from the psycho uh, the psychiatrist Viktor Frankl, who pointed out that suffering is a bit like a gas in a container. It, it spreads out evenly and sort of affects the soul in the same ways, no matter how much of it is there is. So pain kind of, you know, it just sort of has a way of you know taking up our entire consciousness when we're experiencing it. I think our tolerance for other people's suffering and death is kind of similar. And it's a function of, um, you know, uh, uh, we can only experience so much sympathy or compassion. So the question is how, how much of it can we spread sort of per individual person suffering? So I think when we faced extremely high death rates or when we undergo a, a war that has, you know, millions of, of casualties, I think we're actually, and, and we, we, we're outraged by that, or we, we, we were sympathetic toward the people suffering. It seems to me through history that um, we've become less and less tolerant of, of, of death and violence, in, in part because of this idea that the, the amount of suffering we, we experience or the amount of compassion we experience is sort of equal, um, no matter how many people are in the background doing that. So. When there were millions of people, um, we were sort of, you know, in, in, the, in a given epidemic or a given uh, war or other mass, you know, sort of instance of mass suffering. We, we were compassionate about it and desired to do something about it and, and sort of because of the same psychological preferences, emotions we have now. But with so much of it, we had to kind of take a fatalistic attitude. You know, there's, there's no way you're going to save, uh, you know, uh, 18 million people from, uh, you know, the Spanish flu. Uh, but when we're talking, or, you, you know, you're going to save 100,000 people from uh, being war casualties. But as the number of war casualties shrink in, you know, modern warfare, or as we get a better and better handle on how to, how to handle epide uh, epidemics rationally and, and with, you know, and, and with an eye toward results, we we're still concerned about the amount of death, even if it's only a tenth or five percent or two percent of what it would have been uh, one hundred years ago. So yeah, I think we've become less and less tolerant of of you know outrageous suffering, and uh, as there's less and less of it, we continue to say sort of direct the same amount of attention to it that we, we would have directed to uh, you know an instance of mass suffering a hundred or a thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. 
So let me just pursue this point a little bit. So uh, you think that we were always concerned about human suffering. It's just that now we can do more about it. You don't think that humans went through some sort of a genetic or um, 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 ethical evolution that would make us more um, uh, more frightened of death. I, I, I do realize, of course, that your book is about an ethical um, evolution of the species toward greater compassion. But I just want to focus on the toleration of death. Has there been any change or uh, is it really the same amount of energy that we apply toward prevention of death? Yeah, well, great. Yes. I, what we have in our, power, in our power now that we didn't have in ages past is the actual capacity to intervene. So uh, 500 years ago, classic classical Europe, um, our options for actually intervening were, pretty, you know, certainly for intervening effectively, were very limited. The things we knew how to do to um, uh, conduct uh, population-wide surveillance to figure out why people are dying, how many people are dying, where they're dying. We just didn't have that technology. So, um, and because of our worldviews, which were largely at that time, you know, heavily driven by uh, Christian belief, Christian conviction, um, we uh, were, uh, suffering and death were accepted and uh, in some ways even sanctified <clears throat> as, as a way of better understanding God's mercy. Um, we, we ended up, because we didn't have effective ways to intervene, and we had worldviews that said there are some ways and you can get kind of a redemptive sort of meaning from other people's suffering. I think we did we did have a kind of tolerance for it that we simply don't now that we've moved away from a sort of fatalistic attitude toward death. And also we know we have some tools in our toolkit for doing something about it. So our beliefs about death have changed for sure. And our abilities to control or reduce it have, have you know, vastly improved. So I do think uh, we're less tolerant for sure. That's fascinating. Uh, so in the past, um, people would have perhaps even welcome death because it brought them closer to God. They were finally in eternity in heaven. And as the society has secularized and more and more people doubt the existence of afterlife, really, uh, whether you make the best of it and remain on earth as long as you possibly can, that's that's really the key, right? Okay, that's, that's very interesting. Um, I didn't think of that. So um, can you describe how humanity has uh, perhaps tackled pandemics in the past, let's say uh, in Europe previously? You touched upon that subject already. Sure, yeah. Pandemics have always been a part of, yeah, you, know, the, you know, human life. Uh, we have immune systems as, as proof that we've always been uh, preyed upon by um, these, these tiny creatures that want to get into our bodies and turn our cellular machinery into factories for making more of them. So um, we've always confronted them. And as societies got very large, uh, you know, when, as we moved into cities, uh, you know, large, dense cities, and certainly as we moved into, you know, ex the extremely dense cities of, of Europe, uh, you know, 1,000 to 500 years ago, epidem epidemics became uh, concerns for thousands of people, tens of thousands of people at a time, uh, and, and transmission could be very high. So, uh, you know, as, as, as I alluded to a, a couple minutes ago, uh, we sort of accepted epidemics as, uh, you know, a normal part of life. You obviously, we, we had some intuitions about transmission, um, the idea that you want to separate yourself from people who are infected. We, you know, that's, that's something we've known for a long time. But beginning in, uh, a, you know, I, I would say the 16th century, late 15th, uh, early 16th century, um, uh, thinking people, scholars, um, the human humanists of the time really began to ask themselves in a new way uh, how we should think about the the, the you know, the, the vast uh, sort of reservoirs of, of, of humanity that are showing up at the city gates, uh, poor cold, uh, without productive work, uh, in light of the fact that they, ha they, ha they are this vector for pandemic. We, we know, that, they, you know that lots of unhealthy people with disease 
are spread are super spreaders. And not only that, but um, they their their inability to make a living for themselves creates all these second order problems, uh, social unrest. Uh, town squares that you don't enjoy going to that that bum you out because of all the poverty and disease, um, the, the 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 increases in crime, uh, the increases in vice as people try try to find some way to make a living for themselves, and so in in the beginnings of the 16th century, what you see in Europe is actually really interesting. Uh, starting uh, in the city of Bruges, you see the first systematic plans for um, uh, intervening systematically and society-wide in order to uh, improve the economic uh, uh, outlook of uh, st essentially strangers that you don't know but that are in the city um, suffering and also creating all these second order problems. So that's where the, that's actually the first time where we see uh, secular plans uh, managed by the secular authorities within the city, um, get, getting uh, getting their day in court, as it were. Within about 25 years, 35 years of, of, of that period, you see this idea of comprehensive planning uh, involving assessment of individuals' uh, needs, uh, trying to find ways to uh, provide work training, um, whether that's through apprenticeships or um, uh, you know, increase uh, more education. You see this basic idea and um, separating the idle, you know, the idle poor from those individuals who really desire to be productive. Um, you see this idea spreading to the point where it's in 30 or 50 cities uh, throughout Europe within about half, half a century. So this was an idea that was really new. Um, prior to that, uh, concern for the poor was largely driven by a kind of fatalism, the idea that the poor will always be with us. Um, and, it, and charity was largely managed um, to, to it, I believe, to its great credit uh, by the church um, that really did make huge, huge efforts to care for the poor. Um, you nevertheless, nevertheless, the, the way the worldview changed was that it, we would be more effective and more efficient if we put all of these efforts kind of in a, 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 a framework where we can compare apples with apples and uh, avoid duplication of effort and um, work to uh, do something comprehensive and more effective rather than uh, putting band-aids on problems and essentially creating poverty traps where we spend resources but not enough that anybody can really get out of poverty. Was that some sort of an ethical change or did it arise from the increased wealth in Northwestern Europe at around this time? Yeah, um, I, I think those increases in wealth came uh, came slowly um, through, you know, through the beginnings of international trade. And we don't really see those increases in wealth, I, I believe, on my on my reading of, of history, I don't. I don't really see them making a huge dent on, until we get uh, a little bit later in the 16th century with the um, the innovation of poor rates, where this is this is something that started in England, um, uh, where uh, the the, um, the the government of the time decided to start taxing people on the basis of property and wealth in order to create a small fund to provide benefits to the poor, largely in the forms of, of work training, uh, money to buy food, um, some, some how limited expenses for housing, and, and so forth. And these, uh, these amounted to about 1% of gross domestic income in, uh, in England at the time. Similar innovations took place in the Netherlands a little later, and their actual uh, allocations were a little higher. Uh, but these increased to about 2% of GDP in both England and the Dutch Republic, um, and, and were kind of kept at that level until, uh, until they weren't. And some, some economic, and, uh, economic realities in both the Netherlands, uh, the Dutch Republic and England changed so that those, those rates were, were cut as we, as we move into the 19th century. But yeah, there's no doubt that this is on the back of increasing 
wealth, increasing GDP. Um, so we, we, this is often called um, the, the age of prevention, at least that's what, that's what I've come to call it. Um, um, and um, some, other, some, some other economists uh, like that term as well. So in, well, for sure. Well, I want to go to the age of prevention in a moment because uh, obviously I want to get a better sense of uh, the arg main arguments in your book. Um, and I promise that we will. But before we uh, get there, uh, just a couple more questions on uh, the current pandemic. Um, so since you are the specialist on, on compassion, I wanted to ask you um, if you were surprised how quickly uh, the argument for keeping of the shutdown switched from, um, you know, let's shut down the economy for a couple of weeks so that we can get the healthcare system um, ready so that the healthcare system isn't overwhelmed. Yeah. So that was the original argument. And then quickly it switched to an argument that uh, basically we need to keep the economy shut until COVID goes away or until the vaccine comes, uh, that sort of thing. What Were you surprised by that switch? And do you have any theory why that has occurred? I, I was really surprised by that. That was, that was certainly uh, my understanding was to, to prevent us from outstripping uh, the medical system, uh, right. so that you know we would have enough beds and enough resources to take care of the people who who were really sick. But you're right; there was kind of a mission creep with that idea to a, and and not only in the U.S. but you know through through the Europe and and Asia as well that um, a broader effort and a more sustained effort at quarantine would uh, lead to um, you know sort of lower society wide impacts. Um, I actually don't know where. The rhetoric around that shift actually took place, at, you know, at at the level of uh, go, you know governmental decision making. Um, my, my my own theory about it is simply kind of a theory of momentum, and you know, once you have a plan like this in place, and you you have the intuition that it is reducing medical burden, that with once once you've already got a plan like that in motion, you can work to. Um, you know, reduce reduce transmission. You know, uh, in a in a more preventative way. Mm -hmm. and, That's and interesting. So I, I think also, I, again, I I really don't know how how these decisions are made. You know, these decisions are made. I assume they're made on the largely on the basis of values and intuitions. But I I I hope I like to think that. Um, some of those decisions are are sensitive to data, and it does look like in most epidemiological models, we could get very close to outstripping the med our medical resources again in November or December. So, it, you know, this is the kind of thing that might end up, um, you know, in a you know over the course of a, of months, create you know prevent the same problem that initially it was designed to prevent. Um, in addition to uh, whatever salutary effects it might have society-wide right now in reducing transmission and, and morbidity, you know, short of hospitalization. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems to me that at the, uh, at the heart of the uh, differing attitudes to the shutdown, uh, there may be a differing toleration for risk amongst different components of the population. So is there any research on uh, the difference in toleration of, of risk uh, between, say, conservatives and libertarians on the one side and progressives on the other? Do we have any evidence? There's, that's, that's a really interesting thing to think about. Uh, we have a ton of evidence about the psychological differences between um, sort of what, what you, you know, what you would call not little L liberals, but big L liberals, you know, people that would, you know, we would have associated in, in times past with with the Democratic Party, um, who now seem more inclined to call themselves liberals. Uh, and, con you know, conversely, conservatives who, you know, once upon a time, you know, embraced the, the concept of, you know, being Republicans a little bit more. Um, but anyway, conservative, liberal, Republican, Democrat, one of the main, you know, there, there are huge differences. Um, and one does have to do with appetite for risk. Uh, liberals, uh, and this is not just one study, this is a lot of studies. Liberals tend to uh, be worriers. Um, they tend to be uh, more fearful about contingencies that they don't understand. They do think about risks uh, more going forward. Uh, 
So they kind of have, this is not a huge effect, but it's a meaning, you know, it's a difference. It's a robust difference. Uh, they, they, uh, they tend to be a little less self-assured. So they think about the future and they, they do tend to kind of worry and obsess a little bit more than conservatives do. Now, there's a kind of worry that um, sort of uh, conservatives have captured the market on, and that's worries about um, uh, the sort of worries that we would put into, you know, under a label of something like xenophobia or uh, were, you know, concerns about um, people from that are that are different from them. So mm -hmm. in a way that in a way that liberals uh, typically do not worry about uh, things like uh, immigration or um, infection, you know, uh, the, the, the countries that might be transporting infection into the into the country. That's something they tend to worry about. So our worries are sort of different. We worry about we uh, we depending on who you are, uh, liberals tend to uh, worry about um, sort of the unknown in in uh, and and conservatives tend to worry more about uh, the unknown others. So both of these, I think, um, you know, you can see them playing out in liberal versus conservative responses, I think, to the pandemic, where you see, I, I think, uh, among liberals and liberal states, more liberal states, um, uh, more enthusiasm about shutting down the economy in order to prevent morbidity and, and death. They don't talk so much about... Um, controlling immigration or controlling um, travel into the US. That, those are, that's a, a set of worries that you see more in conservative rhetoric. So we worry about different things. That's very interesting. That would imply that uh, uh, the conservative mentality uh, would be one where you stop immigration and travel to the United States, but you say, well, that's as far as we go now um, everybody else just get on with your lives, whereas uh, progressives and liberals, it seems to me, would would say, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> let's keep the borders open and travel and immigration, um, but we are shutting down internally. It, that, 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 yeah. Neither of them make complete yeah. sense, um, but I sort of understand, I, I, I think I understand what you're saying. Well, moving on finally onto your book. Um, so. I think that any rational observer must agree that we we'll live in a significantly, substantially more compassionate society than, say, 2,000 years ago. Um, but not enough time has passed for humanity to change at the genetic level uh, to uh, sort of account for that change in, in compassion. So if not genes, then uh, there must be something else which has turned what you call the selfish ape into, into caring about strangers. Um, so what was it? Uh, and I, I guess this would be a good place to sort of outline the main argument of your book. And I know that you start in axial age and take it all the way to modernity. So uh, the floor is yours. Oh, yeah. Thanks. So... As as I you're you're quite right. Uh, natural selection, uh, uh, acting on on the genes that make you know make our bodies and our minds, uh, moves quite slowly, uh, and we we certainly wouldn't expect massive genetic population wide, uh, you know species wide uh, systematic genetic changes over something like ten or twelve thousand years. So we have to look elsewhere to explain. Why, why it is that today we, uh, the, the world's developed nations spend 20% of GDP or more on, um, on social expenditures, uh, why we take an abiding interest in the welfare of developing countries and so forth. And I really, the, the, the argument that I, I try to make in the kindness of strangers is that we can explain this through the conspiracy of several different kinds of developments over the past 10 millennia or so. Um, the, some of them are ethical. The, the, the things I think that conspire together are developments in ethics, or, uh, developments in um, our worldviews about the causes of suffering uh, and the effects of suffering, um, death, death and disease and poverty. Um, so our ideas and our ideals have changed. Um, our, you know, our basic concepts for understanding the world and we've had a variety of in, uh, ethical innovations in how we think about 
what's good and what's bad and what kind of world we want to have and what the value of other other people is and how we would how we should think about the value of of other people's lives and well-being so we have ideas and ideals and those have uh, worked together with uh, innovations in trade innovations in science and innovations in technology uh, and if you put those pieces together, ideas and ideals, along with uh, cash, um, technology, and scientific insights, what I see happening is an increasing ability to uh, to intervene to try to improve people's welfare and convictions for how we should for why we should do it and convictions about the best ways to do it. So you're right. Uh, the, the way I try to cut up the the cultural evolution of these ideas um, in my book is through sort of setting, you know, uh, sort of as historians often do, trying to set milestones through history where we see uh, sort of hinges, where there are, I, I see sort of major transitions in how we think and how we act. So in the acts, so it goes from you're right. It goes from uh, the axial age, this period uh, where we see the, the the genesis and flourishing of the world religions that we still practice today. Um, they give us the golden rule. They give us some of our really earliest ideas about how to build societies to take an interest in others' welfare. That, that ideas we still live with today. Uh, in Greece, you see the first uh, sort of veterans administration. You see the first work, you know, systematic efforts to employ the poor. Um, you see the first sort of daily um, uh, social security checks, if you like. Uh, and and in in um, axial age Israel, you see the beginnings of, you know, s s similar innovations, but but certainly distinct. Um, you see the idea of soup kitchens and dowries for orphans and the first hospitals and the first schools. In fact, as Jewish tradition developed, you really couldn't establish a new city that didn't have a hospital and didn't have a school in it. So, so you know, these are the first sort of, um, you know, re, sort of er innovations, if you like, for how we would institution build, build institutions. You move, you know, fast forward to uh, classical Europe, Europe of uh, the second millennium. Um, I call this the age of prevention, where in about the 16th century, as we talked about, uh, people start to recognize the second order effects of poverty on the well-being of cities. And we see this notion, we, which we, you know, we've talked about, uh, you know, about the, you know, the, the building of comprehensive, ideally comprehensive top-down systems for monitoring poverty and suffering, uh, diagnosing it, trying to find out the individual causes, and then cre using the right carrots and sticks to motivate the able-bodied to take up activities that would restore them to independence and essentially to create incentives that would make it increasingly painful not to take up those kind, you know, the, the, you know, to not take up activities that would make you self-sufficient. Age of prevention. Then I think we've gone through uh, two poverty en enlightenments. Um, and um, the, the way, uh, the, the way that is often talked about here is that we became aware um, at two different points, one in the, at the beginnings of the, um, at, at the ends of the, pardon me, um, the, the end of the 19th century transitioning over to the beginnings of the 20th century, where we begin to realize our, our understanding of what makes people poor changes. Um, this is, you know, we can trace these ideas to um, the writings of Adam Smith. We can tr uh, trace it to the writings of Immanuel Kant. We can trace it to the writings of Rousseau, um, who each in their own way made contributions to uh, a notion of distributive justice. What Smith added was the idea that the poor are just like everybody else. Um, they have a gene, you know, everyone has a genius for something. Um, everybody wants to, uh, to, to be w better off. Um, he had some, I think, some some uh, fairly radical ideas about um, whether the poor create their own problems or not. Um, he he tended to to view them um, as actually in some ways more industrious and uh, cleverer than uh, 
people of you know, people of fashion, as he called them, who had plenty of money and inheritances and and, and fancy clothes to wear. So he brings that. Um, he brings, of course, he brings his, you know, his, you know, what what we now think of as classical economic worldview, um, that people follow their incentives, and we want to design these societies right so that when people follow their incentives, they're better off. Um, this can, you know, th this idea conspires with the ideas of Rousseau that uh, and Kant that everyone has uh, a sort of equal, particularly Kant, equal and infinite worth, which is a Tough pill to swallow if you follow it to its to its conclusion, but uh, um, if infinite worth ex implies we're willing to spend a lot of money to improve, improve people's well being. Um, but but nevertheless, what what emerges from this is a sense that even the poor have a kind of dignity um, and uh, fundamentally a desire to make a living for themselves. But what we lack for them is a a, a safety net that keeps people from falling too far below. Um, an, ex an acceptable standard of living. So poverty traps essentially uh, occur if we don't provide enough backup for people when times really become hard. So that's a second poverty. Go ahead. Yeah. Let's on the second one. I beg your pardon? Sorry, you're breaking up. Uh, is that the first one or the second one? The first that's poverty, the uh, that's the first. Okay. Th yeah, that's the first poverty enlightenment. Uh, in between the first and the second, uh, we see kind of the equivalent to the poverty and the first poverty enlightenment taking place at the international level, where you begin for the first time to see nations taking an interest in the welfare of, of other nations. And this is largely driven by um, international trade, where countries begin to realize that we have this evolving international trade network so that we become increasingly interdependent on each other as nations for our own welfare. So it doesn't make a lot of sense in, in a way that it used to at one time made sense to watch other nations uh, burn and sink because international relations were viewed largely as a zero sum game. Uh, Spain's losses are England's gains. France's, you know, England's losses are France's gains and so forth. That international trade transforms that to where Spain's losses become England's losses because we are, um, we're, we're, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trading things I value less than your money for um, your money and you're giving your money, which you value less for my goods. Um, so the gains of trade create an international situation where we come to value the welfare of other, of other countries. And we want to intervene where we can, particularly in humanitarian crises. This is really following, um, uh, it overlaps a lot with what I'm calling the first poverty enlightenment. Um, this is when you begin to see voluntary international associations uh, evolve and flourish. This is the era of the Red Cross. This is the era of Save the Children. This is the era of um, the, the professionalization of nursing, um, uh, ultimately leading to sort of this efflorescence of uh, voluntary sort of humanitarian organizations, a lot of which are still with us today. This, this echoes through through the first, first and second world wars where we, um, we see uh, voluntary associations and also the beginnings of multilateral organizations that are trying to intervene, particularly in uh, war-torn countries to uh, improve the, the uh, to, to reduce the suffering of uh, collateral casualties, uh, women and children, uh, non-combatants who uh, inevitably are are the 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 war's victims as much as the soldiers are, and this evolves into concern about the welfare of soldiers themselves, and uh, ultimately it is a recognition that um, even the vanquished countries end up with suffering people in them. Uh, even Germany post World War II was filled with suffering, suffering Germans. Um, the Allied powers came to recognize, ultimately, along with um, uh, voluntary organizations like CARE, or Save the Children, uh, and many others, in fact, that those people, because of humanitarian convictions, have a right to care as well. So, and was that the, and that would be the, uh, the, the second poverty enlightenment? I, I'm calling that the humanitarian Big Bang, where we begin... Oh, okay where we begin to realize 
that, um, and this is due to Mike, that concept is due to Michael Barnett, who's at George Washington University, actually. Um, he calls this era, and he, and he, and he uh, writes about it um, really, in a really lovely way. He refers to this as the humanitarian Big Bang, where we, we begin to take this abiding interest in, uh, in international relations become not merely relations uh, regulated by war and trade, but we begin to, to think about how we can corporately work to address suffering everywhere. Um, mm. So, so if, if one were to summarize the steps uh, that you are making in the uh, in the compassion revolution, I guess uh, would be first you have the axial age where um, where where the golden rule becomes the norm uh, in uh, in in places where civilization flourishes. Then you move into the age of prevention, where cities like Bruges start putting into place uh, some forms of very basic taking care for people who are really hard up. You move into the first uh, poverty enlightenment, uh, which is almost like the most basic uh, social safety net. And then you get into the second poverty enlightenment, uh, which is a more, uh, more, uh, more generous uh, aid um, to, to the poor, a greater social welfare net that would be the hallmark of, let's say, post-Second World War Europe and so forth. Would, would that be the correct um, summary of, of, of the book itself? Yeah. Um, this, by the way, this, this notion of two poverty enlightenments is due to the uh, welfare economist uh, uh, Martin Ravayon, who's uh, at George Wash uh, Georgetown, excuse me. So um, I've been influenced by a lot of people in Washington, D.C. As I, as I put this book together, as it turns out. He talks about a he, he talks about a first Please, and a second yeah first poverty enlightenment uh, Ravayon um, uh, Michael Barnett giving me this um, humanitarian Big Bang and then the second poverty enlightenment which is post World War II where we begin to apply the same sorts of convictions and ideas to uh, that we were bringing to uh, sort of domestic concerns about the well being of people within our own countries and people in war-torn uh, countries and humanitarian crises, we're now going to start to bring that thinking post-World War II to the developing world, where we see poverty sort of not concentrated, uh, we're not focused on the poor within our own borders, um, or the humanitarian, suffer humanitarian suffering of people outside our borders, but now we're thinking about how do we address poverty in you know, what we used to call the third world, but now we call the developing world, so that ultimately, we can create, pardon me, create self-sufficiency in those countries as well. Mm -hmm. Very good. So um, th that is the outline of the book, and, and these are primarily changes in ideas, but there were other um, aspects of, of the uh, change in compassion, such as you described science, trade, and so forth. So let's go through them very quickly. What, in addition to ideas, has changed to make humanity more compassionate? Uh, we should start with trade because I, I think in a lot of ways it, it is um, in, in, it's, it's a kind of prime mover. Uh, you can't help people if you don't have the resources to help them. So um, the fact that we've become so prosperous in the developed world uh, due to trade and due to you know due to technological innovations that allow us to get more bang for our buck means we have the cash on hand to think about other people's well-being. So. Where once, you know, where in um, 16th and 17th century England uh, in, the in the Dutch Republic, we're talking about 1% to 2% of GD uh, gross domestic income that we're devoting to care for the poor. You know, n now most of the, you know, most of the developed nations are spending 20, 25% of gross domestic income on domestic concern. Likewise, we're spending billions of, hundreds of billions of dollars a year on development in the in the developing world you can't do that if you don't have the cash on hand so uh, and i attribute this really to the gains of trade over you know the course of you know several centuries it's because we're wealthy that we're able to be compassionate uh, technology has given us the ability to know about other people's suffering and to do something about it you know back in um back in the 18th century and I guess, you know, going back to the beginning of horse, horseback travel, news traveled on land at about two miles per hour. 
and ship on ships that traveled at a much slower rate. So if you were to discover something about other people's suffering uh, elsewhere, it was going to get to you at the, the rate of two miles per hour. Now we learn about people suffering at the, at the speed of electrons, essentially. We can find out about earthquakes in Haiti or tsunamis uh, in the South Pacific um, or earthquakes, uh, um, wars, civil wars, unrest within a matter of you know, minutes after it, it takes place. So we can act more quickly due to technology. How important is seeing the suffering with your own eyes, you being more compassionate? I think it is really uh, important that we uh, see through our own eyeballs where people's, uh, to see people suffering if, if, if we're going to be engaged in sort of our evolved systems for care, um, uh, if, if, if we're going to respond to, 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 suff to um, suffering on the basis of sort of that evolved cognitive hardware we've got. So in the, so in the, in the modern world where we're learning about mass suffering in other places, you can learn about it through television. You can learn about it through the newspaper. Um, for, you know, th those media uh, don't work so well at moving the soul, moving the human spirit. But when we use technology to sort of bring individuals, people suffering to us through a screen, um, this, this, this ability to identify individual suffering people, sick children, uh, bereaved, uh, bereaved mothers, bereaved wives and husbands. Um, this does engage some of our evolved cognitive hardware that motivates us to care. Um, and so um, what aid agencies have, have learned over the years is that if you create television that identifies individual children, individual suffering children, individual grieving mothers, you can move people's heartstrings in a way that you can't do with hard, cold statistics. So um, during the TV, during the television age, particularly after the, the, uh, the, the war in Vietnam, we got better and better at trying to move people's heartstrings um, by, you know, with individual people's narratives and um, pre pre presenting them with the promise that by helping that individual person, we could raise their welfare, we could make them better off, we could get them out of their problem. So yeah, we confront a kind of innumeracy when we face suffering and cold hard statistics. We don't feel that much different when we see that the death rate due to um, a particular, um, um, pr particular tragedy is 10 people per million. We don't feel that any differently than we feel a death rate of um, 200 per million or 1,000 per million. It just they don't move us any differently. It's that face-to-face -face contact that ends up making uh, moving our heartstrings in the biggest direction. Um, one follow-up question on this. Um, does our compassion decline in intensity with distance? I mean, the way I think about it is that obviously I'm willing to do much more for my sibling than I'm willing to do for my cousin, even less to do for a friend, than even less for a fellow citizen until ultimately somebody on the other side of the world will get only a fraction of the compassion I'm willing to spend on my immediate family. Can we, can, can, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, sure. We can, we can think about, uh, ourselves in the middle of uh, a set of concentric circles. And um, what uh, several psychologists have suggested is that we engage in a process of social discounting in the same way that economists talk about temporal discounting. Um, the things, the, the, the goods we have at our, uh, that we have available to us right now have more value than goods we can only, the same good that we can only get into the future. So we discount the value of, of, of uh, nice things we might have in the future relative to their present value. And their suggestion, uh, behavioral e economist's suggestion, is that we do a similar kind of discounting with regard to human beings. The, the nearest and dearest to us have a greater value or weight. We're, able, we're willing to spend more of our resources or our time or our energy to the benefit of their welfare than we are to individuals that are neighbors uh, neighbors or people in our communities or people in our country or people in other countries or even enemies. 
So we do engage, we seem to have a psychology that does discount their value. And, and, and what tracks that is um, the amounts we're willing to pay to ease their suffering. You know, I have two kids. I would give almost anything to alleviate their serious suffering. Um, I can't say that I would do the same for someone that's more remote from me. So the mind, and I think this is, the, the mind has evolved to engage in this discounting process because um, natural selection would have evolved us for having these preferences. Uh, I am genetically, the genes in me are, are better off uh, in terms of their ability to spread into the population if I'm focused on helping those who can help me in return or carry some of my genes around as a result of being related to them. So I do think this is a, fe a feature of human nature. I see. So if compassion depended solely on the genes, then uh, it would have been, on, on, on your reading, it would have probably been more restricted. It would, be, it, it would certainly not reach the levels that we have today. For that, we needed an ethical revolution. Would, would that be a good summary of your thinking? That's, exa that's exactly right, yeah. Oh, we need that, yeah. That, um, so now let me play the devil's advocate uh, I have in, in the two last questions that I have for you. So uh, in, in your book, you describe a progression toward ever greater compassion. You start in axial age, then you have age of prevention, then you have two poverty enlightenments, um, and then the humanitarian bank. Um, and the question is, is there such a thing as too much compassion? You know, so just as people say, you know, two drinks a week are probably good for you, but two drinks a night are uh, probably bad for you. Um, you know, what would you say to those who argue that uh, compassion should probably have stopped in the Enlightenment? or after the first poverty um, uh, enlightenment. Um, um, it, it, you, you, your, your work seemed to imply a sort of linear progression towards something good. So let's start with a question, can there be too much compassion? Yeah, absolutely. I think if, if, um, if you think of compassion as um, something largely driven by emotions. I mean, if we want to equate it with something like sympathy, then I, I think the research is really clear that it's a pretty untrustworthy guide to effective, you know, building, building societies that are responsive and uh, optimal for meeting the needs of, uh, helping to meet the needs of, you know, the poor and suffering. Um, as the psychologist Paul Bloom has, has pointed out, um, sympathy is, uh, parochial and it's enumerate. Um, when we feel we we feel uh, much more sympathy and a desire to intervene uh, in on the behalf of a single ind identifiable individual, um, the classic case being a child in a you know who's fallen into a well or a single sick ki a single sick child in a hospital, we'll spend much much we're willing to spend much much more per capita to help that individual than we are to use the same amount of resources. Um, with a, a target like um, a donation to a children's hospital. Um, so uh, we, uh, with the same amount of goods, uh, we're, we will invest much more in a single child because of our sort of, e e e the, the way our heartstrings are moved by compassion than we would uh, to a, a, um, a impersonal, anonymous kind of institution that would do actually more good per, per unit of, of, of contribution. It's also parochial. We tend to prefer helping people who are, we have an affinity for, the near and dear, our friends, people who have our same religion or our same political views. So compassion is, I think, an untrustworthy guide, which is why I think it's re reason and science and technology have, been, are, particularly science, uh, are, have, are so important going forward to make uh, good decisions. Um, you're right, we could have too much compassion um, I think um, spend poorly, invest our energies and time poorly. That's it. That's it. I, th I think the research suggests the, in the, the, the mind's natural state. That is what we can expect to happen, um, which is why we need reason and the guidance of science to make um, to make decisions of that that with regard to other people's welfare that are going to be good decisions that are going to be effective decisions. So you're. you're your 
compassion and your appreciation of compassion is not boundless. For example, you would accept that there can be such things as unintended consequences or moral hazard, and we need to guard against that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, in the final chapter of my book, I, I talked about some of the concepts that have made us smarter as we think about poverty, suffering, disease, war deaths. Uh, and some of those are economic concepts, the idea of the poverty trap, the idea of the Gini coefficient, uh, the idea of j diminishing returns. But I really wish I'd introduced the concept of moral hazard. That's one I didn't mention in the book um, because it's a great tool for thought. Um, so basically, moral hazard, for, for folks who might be less familiar with it, uh, is the idea that um, costs and benefits of taking risks can be asymmetric if you don't incentivize people properly. So um, if my kid knows that I'll pay for the car if he wrecks it, um, whereas he gets to enjoy the benefits of it if he doesn't wreck it, uh, creates moral hazard. Um, he can drive more carelessly knowing that, well, dad will, dad and mom will, will pay for any damage. That's, that's essentially moral hazard. So the same thing applies in the world of, uh, you know, uh, um, social expenditures or expenditures in the developing world. We have to worry about um, whether people will take those resources and use them wisely or use them to bad ends with us footing the bill. Um, I really think this is um, this is something uh, development economists have worried about a lot, and um, it's it's well worth thinking about. And, and as I've re read the literature, um, I'm certainly not a development economist, so I'm just uh, a, a guy that tries to read and understand. Um, they've taken this into to account, and um, one of one of the ways you can look at its effects. Uh, well, first of all, you can one you can try to understand, and then potentially mitigate effects, is simply to look at the data uh, and to determine whether, uh, on average, interventions, particularly in um, developing countries, but not only, also domestically, you can ask whether those interventions pay their way in terms of growth or in terms of bringing people to a state of well-being where they can work and then pay for the the, the benefits they received by getting better jobs, uh, working more, and then paying taxes, higher rate, higher taxes back into the system. So you can ask yourself, there may be moral hazard, but let's see if the moral hazard is ignorable enough that the net benefits through the population that are affected for it essentially pay for themselves or better. Right. There are so it's an, partly an empirical question, as, 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 as you say. The reason why I raise this uh, subject is because uh, people who put a lot of emphasis on compassion. I, I, I'm sure that both of us are compassionate people, but people reading your book and being even more compassionate might see it as a uh, license to, for example, um, international redistribution of wealth uh, and, and massive financial transfers between rich and poor countries. Um, certainly a lot of people have talked about it before. Um, but even somebody like um, even somebody like John Rawls, in his last book before he died, was against it, saying that that would incentivize uh, could incentivize bad behavior on the parts of government. I mean, my my favorite example of this would be uh, Zimbabwe, a country which I knew well, um, which has basically destroyed its entire economy. Uh, and now is dependent on uh, on uh, international handouts um, under the same government. The same government has been in place for 40 years. So you don't want to reward uh, those governments for uh, for bad behavior. And that brings me to the last question that I want to ask and possibly the most controversial. What is the place for pain in in life? I mean, we have obviously evolved the sensation for pain. Um, for a purpose. We don't go around sticking our hands into fire all of the time because pain tells us you you cannot do that. And um, I, I wonder about the place of pain in terms of stimulating progress, whether pain is actually necessary uh, for stimulation of society to go forward and whether compassion can dampen 
the occurrence of pain at both individual but especially social level. Because at an individual level, I think that we all jump in and try to help people out of charity or compassion or because they're members of family, or whatever. But pain at a at a social level, such as you know what's happened in Zimbabwe 20 years ago, um, is it necessary for social progress? Um, can we learn without it? Uh, this, I followed the Zimbabwe tragedy as well, it, and it and it was it's it's truly one of the most appalling I think his, you know uh, uh, international stories in history in the way that. Um, they really did wreck their economy through some <clears throat> extremely, you know, bad decisions. Um, I think pain is how we learn, surely, and um, we we uh, determine where pain is. I think at the level of systems uh, by figuring out what works and what doesn't work. So um, obviously, we're not feeling feeling physical pain when we see um, um, this or that policy's effects. So we try to find a currency that we can all work with to understand pain. And, and the best currency we have is actual currency. So we, we look at the costs and benefits of particular policies and try to steer courses ultimately that create the least, uh, that cost the, the, the least or that provide the greatest benefits. So we can look at the, you know, I can't feel the cost of someone who's got a chronic illness or uh, someone who um, is, um, you, know, you know, a child that is missing a meal a day or two meals a day because they can't be in school right now. I, I can't personally feel that pain. So what we, I believe we try to do largely is convert those different kinds of pain into dollar costs. And then we look at um, when we're at when we're being our best selves uh, using reason and science, we simply try to come up with the best estimates that we can derive for the cost and benefits associated with doing nothing and the cost of benefits associated with doing a particular kind of suffering. So ultimately, I think to you know this is again is a, an appeal to reason to the exercise of reason within the realm of. Um, policy, welfare economics, and development economics. What are the courses, the, the least worst courses, uh, the most affordable courses we can make to um, maximize net welfare? Uh, whether that's with, uh, uh, you know, probably the most salient example we can think of right now is the, uh, the COVID shutdown. Uh, we are certainly bearing um, some economic costs associated with lost, uh, in, uh, lost commerce um, lost consumption. Um, but that's so that's a real cost. That's real pain that people are experiencing. Um, and then there are all the um, there is um, a there is the pain of of hospitalization, the pain of morbidity, the pain of death, and the suffering associated with the people who are losing those loved ones. So the question is for a rational society is how do we steer policy in a way? that leads to the greatest economic pay. Um, it doesn't have to be economic, but that's a, a, you know, that's a way of comparing apples and apples. How do we create policies that um, uh, around something like a shutdown of the country, uh, social distancing, how do we, what policy should we have that creates the, um, the greatest financial upside? Um, both of them have costs, both so of them bring benefits. Right. So I was worried that we would be too far apart in our um, sort of take on the social welfare state. But uh, if I understand you correctly, um, you know, you are not advocating simply piling one social program on to, onto another indefinitely. In fact, what you are arguing is that we have to evaluate the existing social welfare system continuously and hopefully in a spirit of bipartisan interest in doing good um, and 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 see what works and what doesn't and hopefully even learn from the rest of the world and see what they are doing right which we are doing wrong something that I'm, I'm, I'm totally in favor of um, is that a good summary of, of where you come down on things uh, I, I I believe we need to have the stomach for getting rid of things that aren't working 
there are certainly some interventions we're making. There, there must be some interventions, and, and we know there are from, from the, the best empirical data. There are some things we're doing in, in the world to try to make the world a better place that aren't that don't work. They make people, uh, on average, worse off, or they are kind of break-evens with opportunity costs that go along with them that, um, that prevent us from having taken another course of action. So I'm a big fan of data and allowing these conversations to be governed by data and reason. So fortunately, we, um, we do have people who stay up at night um, in front of their computers and their data sets trying to figure out what's what is the best course of action? What programs should we scrap? Which programs should we develop further and strengthen? Um, and, in a, and in a world where we, could, we had the stomach for making tough choices, um, we had the political stomach for, for doing away with things that, um, doing away with entitlements that don't work, um, which will anger constituents and building programs that seem like they would work at the, at the risk of angering other constituents. Um, it's going to be through good faith debates in the presence of uncertainty, in the presence of not being able to perfectly predict the future, that we can have good faith arguments and good, make good faith attempts to, kind of, to, to build the kinds of societies we want, where the largest number of people can flourish. Well, Michael, that's a wonderful way to end our uh, discussion. I'm truly glad that I got to read your book. I appreciate it. I, I learned a lot from it. Um, we will publish this interview probably next week, Friday, and uh, we'll include a link to your book. And I highly recommend it to all of our viewers. I thank you very much for coming on the program. Thank you so much, Marion. I really enjoyed talking with you.